Okay, welcome. Hopefully we have everybody here, Alexandra. We're in the main room now. Uh, we'll give it a minute. So you give me the go ahead, thumbs up when you think everybody's connected to the meeting. All right, all right. I'm a Scott Ratzman. Um, I'm a, a director of operations for Plasti Pack Packaging. Um, we're based in Plymouth, Plymouth, Michigan. We have a, a large facility in uh, in the in the Garland, uh, and uh, I'm also responsible for facilities in the southern region of North America. So, I'd like to start off by saying welcome to everybody for the initial DCMA Symposium of the year, and thank the companies represented here on the call, and thank the City of Garland, GSID folks that are with us today and uh, uh, thank our sponsors, Veritex Bank and GHD for their support in making this session possible. Um, we're gonna move pretty quickly here. So I'm gonna call right now on Russell Duckworth from uh, Veritex Bank uh, to, so he can let us know how the bank's been doing in this situation. Thank you, Russell. Let's see. Okay, I'm, I'm unmuted now. I, I've told somebody this week that I think there's probably an opportunity for somebody in marketing to come up with a, a word that describes that awkward moment between the time you realize you're on mute and that you get unmuted and apologize for being muted. So tried to avoid that, but didn't quite work. So thank you, Scott. And before I talk about the Dallas County Manufacturing Association and Veritex, I wanted to say thank you. Um, I don't Think you're aware but years ago my experience with Gary Day at Converter Clutch on Austin Street uh, progressed to my experiences with Leadership Garland as class advisor over the last two years and I have so much respect for my personal experiences in the Garland manufacturing community um, manufacturers who innovate and create and in the process develop and educate and literally drive our economy and it also gave me an opportunity to reflect on some lessons that uh, you can take away from COVID and that you can learn from slipping and falling and sitting down in a puddle of acetone. I don't know if anybody's ever had that experience, but uh, whether that translates into an action like safety first as a mindset or as measure twice cut once as a practice or the industry independent mind the pennies and the dollars take care of themselves. It's important to come together and share our experiences of what we learned for the benefit of our community. And not just for prag pragmatic business reasons, but because your employees are my friends and family and my teammates at Veritex are your friends and family. And so we can talk about the features of banking all day long, just like Scott could describe the technical specifications of his product or any of you could drive into metallurgy or the physics and forces that are placed on your products as they travel through interplanetary travel. But um, there are products that differentiate Veritex Community Bank and when I say bank, some of you automatically imagine your bank or the teller uh, that you're familiar with and their smiling face. And if you don't have that relationship with your banker that allows you to visualize what I just described, then you or someone you know has experienced something that's probably very similar to something that sounds like, I called my bank for a PPP loan and no one called me back. Or... Even if you have a great relationship with your banker, you may have heard, well, we don't have an SBA department, so that's gonna be a challenge for us to help you with. I wanna take a second to introduce some members of my team that are on the call today. Uh, you'll see Ann Caps there. Ann and I work together in the specialty finance uh, department at Veritex. Uh, we're responsible for accounts receivable financing or factoring. Um, you'll see Chris Henricks and Helma Gentry on the call also, and they are uh, all stars in our SBA department. And I can't say enough about those folks and how hard they've worked for our entire community over the past few weeks. So if you guys have any questions uh, that bubble up about SBA through the course of the, the hour today, um, I would ask that you just, you know, chat up uh, Chris Hendricks or Helmut Gentry there about those SBA questions, or if you have questions about accounts receivable financing or factoring or how we can help with cash flow, uh, just uh, chat with Ann or I. But as we talk about evaluating, evaluating what's happened over the last several weeks, um, in addition to evaluating our business continuity plans or our employee safety plans, 
or our remote work policies, which have been front of mind for everybody, I'd ask you to put this item on your important and urgent task list. Thoughtfully evaluate my banking relationships. Because if your criteria for a banking partner begins with, I need ATMs on every corner, then you have some choices. Uh, and of course our ATM network is pretty impressive too. And if you see your bank as a partner, as a valued toolkit of financial solutions, then you have to look deeper and retool and innovate and improve accordingly. So I'm gonna talk over some information here as, as we move forward. Uh, this, is, this is the team here in Garland. Uh, so again, if you've got uh, any questions, I'd invite you to take this information even after the presentation and reach out to any one of us. So I'm sure some of you will recognize uh, commercial real estate in the presentation here and SBA, and you might be surprised that some of those are available uh, at a community bank, commercial industrial accounts receivable financing. But how many of you realize over the course of a few minutes just recently that you needed a relationship with an SBA banker? Well, I'll wait for you to think about that. Uh, what's the old saying? If your only tool is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. Well, in this case, you needed an SBA approved PPP labeled hammer if you're gonna keep your employees paid and pivot to a PPE production process. So when you look at your current financial toolkit, what do you see? Do you see a hammer or do you see something innovative like you expect to see when you look inside your own business? Do you see the relationships and connections to the products that you need to succeed? So when you're ready to retool and resharpen the saw of your banking relationship, I just ask you for one thing, and it's the same thing that you expect from your internal processes for procuring your business resources. And that is give Veritech Community Bank an opportunity to compete for your business. Because the truth is, and I can say this with all humility and as a member of this business community, and as Martin Luther King Jr. said concisely, whatever affects one directly, affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And so when you look at the team I represent, a team of professionals, professional bankers, you see the package on a product that contains much more. So let me tell you what the reality is about the toolkit that I'm talking about. We've got city council members. We've got school board trustees. Nonprofit board chairs and members, you know, with hands-on community involvement here in our community. People with deep experience and careers that focus on people first. Teachers, nurses, ministers, small business owners, mothers, fathers, sons and daughters. So some of you know Jamie Miller. He's the market president here in Garland. And two things I know about Mr. Miller. He's got a heart for this community the size of Texas. And he's a great banker. And he cares about his team and his customers in that role. So you need to know somebody like Jamie Miller. Dana Cooper. Now during the PPE event, she made herself available around the clock for her customers to get organized and submit their PPP applications. Get it approved, get it closed, get it funded. And again, thanks to Chris and Helma uh, for, the, for the backroom work that got all that stuff done. She did it with a smile. I saw her in person, her grace and caring throughout that entire process because emergency room nurses like Dana Cooper know how to take care of people. I've known Ann Capps, my boss, for 30 years through my consulting career, and now as a teammate in the bank. And in that time, I personally witnessed her creativity and skill at creating opportunities for small businesses and startups that are struggling with cash flow, and how she would blend products like SBA, commercial, and factoring facilities to help. And to say that she cares about her clients does not say enough. In a note that she shared with me last week, one of our clients said, central to our relationship with Veritex is the personalized and empathetic attention we receive in each interaction. So if, if you're looking for a bank that knows how to handle transactional business, if that's the most important thing to you, you've seen it in the presentation here and you'll have a chance to go back and review it later as a part of what Alex will send out. But I'd ask that you look beyond the features of what we are as a bank into the benefits of working with people who care about our community. And that's what community banking is all about. Now our accounts receivable financing product is one of the important differentiators at Veritex Community Bank. Your business may enjoy access to a line of credit. It may have customers that are able to pay on time and maybe cash flow is not a problem for you. But if you have a customer or supplier who's struggling with cash flow, 
ask them to call me. Cash flow is a foundation for any strong business and healthy financial statements that are needed to acquire lines of credit or commercial or SBA loans are based on sound foundations like cash flow. Now the truth is we want your business and we're willing to compete and work every day to earn it. The truth is we're Texans who care about our community and want to see our community succeed. The truth is, truth is in our DNA and it's in our name. We're Veritex Community Bank and my name is Russell Duckworth. My best to you all, please be well. Scott, back to you. Russell, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I wanna thank you personally for your continued support of the DCMA and Veritex you know, support. It, it means a lot to us, so. So uh, proud to be a part of this community. I can't even verbalize it. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to call on Bob Armacost, the North American digital leader for GHD. He's going to give us an overview of the company and introduce his team, and there'll be a, a presentation he'll be providing today. So, Bob, go ahead. Great. Thank you very much, Scott, and I hope uh, you can uh, all hear me. Uh, I am um, going to spend a, a few minutes talking uh, along with my colleague, Dyron Hamlin, uh, on some very important topics, which is about uh, resiliency. And I hope you can all see my slides. Uh, I put them in the slideshow mode. And I want to just give a little bit of background to start with uh, around what we're going to do over the next few minutes. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll kick it over to Dyron. Uh, as all of us know, and we've been living with the COVID pandemic has and still is uh, uh, unleashing unprecedented impact on our economy and our workplace. And as organizations like uh, like yours and everyone in the economy look to, to restore operations, restore uh, their facilities and so forth, it's critical and imperative for, uh, for them to be uh, thinking holistically about how to uh, ensure health and safety of, uh, of staff and employees and customers, uh, to build and sustain trust with them, and ultimately um, uh, ensure business continuity because of the enormous downsides of, uh, of failure or problems in our environment. So what we're going to do is take a, a few minutes to talk through some learnings and insights uh, that organizations sh should be thinking about as they move forward. And these draw from work that we've done uh, with clients and are doing with clients uh, today uh, in a number of industries. Uh, and, um, and those industries include manufacturing, uh, office environments, uh, hospitals, uh, logistics firms, even cultural facilities. And, and we will put a little bit of a spin around some of the digital tools and digital enablers that we are working with and seeing as being quite helpful uh, to organizations as they move ahead. Uh, we know that there's a wide range of organizations that are here on the call, and we're really pleased to, 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 to be here to talk with you. And no doubt this is not a group of beginners. We absolutely know that. Uh, so we really look forward to, uh, to a healthy conversation after we, uh, we go through things. Um, before I turn it over to, to Dyron, uh, and uh, I'll just start with, with this slide. This is what I look like when I'm not on video. Uh, so I'm the North America Digital Leader for GHD, uh, which is our, our business unit as part of GHD's larger business. Uh, our digital team focuses on enterprise digital enablement and, and digital transformation. And I'm joined with my colleague, Dyron Hamlin, uh, who will uh, talk in a second. Uh, we also have a couple of other folks from GHD who are, are, are joining. Um, one in particular is uh, Shashank Ramanan. He's another member of our digital team. Uh, and he, he will be saying a few words a little bit later as well. So uh, with, that, uh, with that intro, let me turn it over to Dyron. Uh, Dyron, for you to introduce yourself, and then we can, uh, we can get, uh, get into the materials. Sure thing. Good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully, you can hear me as well. Um, so like Bob said, uh, I, and hopefully my background is showing right side right for you guys. It shows backwards for me, but I do handle the uh, emergency response and uh, industrial hygiene programs for GHD uh, throughout North America. And it's interesting, uh, I'll just say May 5th, um, at about 8.09 a.m., the world shifted a little bit when Mark Cuban, one of your own, uh, tweeted about the American Industrial Hygiene Association. So 
if people weren't familiar with industrial hygiene before May the 5th at 8.09 a.m. when Mark Cuban tweeted that, another uh, few million followers became aware and kind of highlighted the, the role of the industrial hygienic, a hygienist in a pandemic is, is something that uh, has really become, you know, a hot topic for us. And uh, we've seen a real, of course, shift in our business from doing, you know, a lot of field work, a lot of sampling, uh, a lot of in-plant type work to shifting to, like Bob said, looking at digital tools and how can we support people remotely and how can we be smart about using on-site resources and beyond that, looking to the sustainability of keeping businesses open and keeping things running and what happens if we do get an upset condition in a certain part of the facility, uh, you know, where we may have a, t a positive test and things like that. And so we've kind of retooled our business. I've been really proud of our team and, and kind of how we've shifted. Um, and I know everybody's <laughs> experiencing the same thing. So hopefully can share a few lessons learned from the IH community and kind of what we've done. If you want to hit the next slide there, Bob, just I think we wanted to give a little background as to who we were. I've been with GHD since about 2011. I'm in a small office here in Little Rock, Arkansas, about 10 of us here. Um, we do have people all over the world, a little over 10,000 of us. Um, mostly engineers and scientists and my background I think I mentioned is in chemical engineering and uh, recently became a certified industrial hygienist if you want to hit the next one Bob I think it'll show just here in North America uh, I think Jake Ferenz you mentioned is our INM leader that sits right in you guys backyard there in Dallas so I know some of you are familiar with Jake um, and there's just a, a map of our offices. Obviously, I think we all know, if you want to hit the next one, what the, the headlines have been recently. And we've been engaged, like, like Bob said, on a number of these uh, manufacturing issues. And I think it was mentioned earlier, uh, and maybe a sidebar discussion too, that certain sectors are extremely busy right now, and certain ones are facing you know, other challenges, uh, trying to navigate which of those, you know, need sort of the, the heavy attention, you know, like the meat plants that you heard uh, with some potential supply chain issues, you know, also sort of some pushback, I know, in different areas and trying to find that sweet spot between what the regulatory expectations are and those regulatory climate issues um, as well as the economic issues of maintaining operations and production. And you know what is safe, and it's brought a lot uh, of these sort of uh, risk comparison questions, you know, into a very sort of tight focus. So that's been a lot of what we've spent our time around, Bob. If you want to hit the next one, um, just to kind of introduce, I guess, you know, what we're really focused on right now is you know maintaining people's health first and foremost. And I think, you know, that's got to be a primary message that's coming across is that, you know, production, things of that nature, obviously, will, will always take a backseat to health. But how can we maintain that production and that continuity in light of, you know, sort of this, this unknown risk, this risk that may not present itself uh, with a lot of uh, folks that are asymptomatic. Um, so it, it's really forced us to take a step back and think about those tools that we can put in place to, to keep those operations going um, and to be able to respond quickly and effectively if, you know, like, like we said, a hotspot does pop up. So if you want to hit the next slide there, Bob. Um, basically, you know, we, we, we look at this sort of in terms of the three R's, uh, response, recovery, and resiliency. Um, you know, very similar to sort of how we thought, you know, in kind of a sustainability model, you know, across our firm and in all, all of the different sectors that we work in, you know, our initial response, and I, I mentioned, you know, I handle our, what I call it, what we call our GHD first program. That's our emergency response program. And so a lot of my career has been spent, uh, you know, basically responding to critical issues such as spills and fires and things of that nature. So a little, a little of this, I would say, was uh, maybe a bit second nature, um, maybe kind of shifting and adapting on the fly is so, sort of what I've, I've done for a long time. And, you know, I, I know we had a sidebar discussion earlier, too, about looking at those plans and those 
things that we have in place to be prepared when something like this happens. And I think this really blindsided a lot of people. And so what we'll see, I think, as a shift is, you know, we're taking it from this response phase into a recovery phase, which is where we find ourselves now. How can we, how can we effectively protect and prepare for what that next phase is, which is we don't want any more surprises. We want to be resilient. We want to work our way towards the sort of the upper end of this vertical spectrum here where we're active instead of passive. And so we've seen a lot of really good thought leadership from, you know, not just obviously within GHD, but from our clients. And I think that goes back to Bob's comment earlier about, you know, let's, as we move forward in this, you know, we're, we're going to share what we think are some some good tools and things, but we know we're dealing with a mature audience and they're interested to hear from you guys as well as the things that you've seen be effective. So if you want to hit the next slide there, Bob, uh, you'll see this wheel sort of crop back up in a few of our slides uh, as we go through the presentation. This wheel we kind of see as representing that process of the three R's of moving through that response into recovery and on into resiliency. So you know, we've seen some of those critical infrastructure sites that have remained open through the the first two, three months of, of this pandemic uh, and what's been necessary to keep those operating. We've seen sort of that responsiveness go all the way to the top, right, where you see, um, you know, the president of Tyson, for example, take out a full page ad in the New York Times and make the point that, you know, this is critical to our food supply for our nation. And making sure that those meat packing plants are up and running is is obviously a mission critical situation so identifying initially what those key elements are and you know making sure that those are addressed first but within that framework immediately comes in the need to develop some safety guidelines right so th that is where i think a lot of companies find themselves now um you know figuring out what that does look like what is that process of bringing people back into the workplace and I know if you're not in the middle of that now maybe you're on the tail end of that and you've got some some policies and procedures in place once those facilities and offices are open uh, understanding what is going to be necessary to keep them open I think is you know maybe a place that a lot of people find themselves right now having some detailed plans for how to respond to an outbreak or how to respond to a positive case and what is needed from the standpoint of recovery in that process. You know, putting some detailed plans in place where those issues are, are identified quickly, uh, which may be on to the next segment there of implementing and monitoring. You know, making sure you've got tools in place that give you that sort of initial, very rapid indicator that, that something may need to be done. And then this is a constant, uh, you know, re review and improve, um, continuous improvement feedback loop that, that we're working through here as well. So I think if you want to hit the next slide, um, you know, that transitions us into whenever we start thinking quickly and we start thinking big data, you know, I think that automatically triggers the idea that we need some digital solutions around this. So I want to share with you just a couple of things that we've, you know, identified starting with the first uh, segment in the wheel, which is to define those safety guidelines. So making sure you've got uh, a way to identify any changes and new guidelines. We've seen how quickly those can shift uh, in the middle of this over the last few months, how, you know, what's recommended one day might be completely pulled out the following and a new, a new guideline put in, making sure those issues are being tracked. Um, looking at what those requirements are and the thresholds, maybe of temperature or the questions that need to be asked, making sure the stock of supplies that you may need in order to effectively respond if you do have an issue, making sure if you need subcontractors lined up, all those pieces need to be in place, um, you know, prior to, to, to really being able to open confidently, I guess, is, is where this is. So, very early on in the stages, I think, you know, we, we looked at some digital enablers and I'll throw it back to you, Bob, if you want to talk about a few of those tools that we sure. put into place. Yeah, that's, that's great. And, you know, I, I want to make a, before we kind of get into um, some of the examples, I want to just make a, a couple of quick comments. Um, you know, I think one of the things we've seen through the last couple of months is the, the health and safety 
officers in organizations are, are now a, a top table role uh, that is relevant to uh, the, everyone in the C-suite. And uh, when we think of all of the challenges that health and safety officers have uh, historically around everything around reporting and, uh, and uh, management and compliance, uh, there's now an entirely new level of of the, the need to, to maintain health and safety for em, employees and, and customers. And um, when we think of the role that digital can play, really it, it can help across everything we're gonna talk about in this wheel to do really three things. You know, One is to just help improve the ability to kind of capture and manage data that you need uh, to run the business uh, and make decisions. Secondly, it's about automating process to help streamline activities uh, and, and help uh, streamline decision making. And thirdly, it's about applying analytics in the right way uh, to improve uh, your sense of the future and improve by your ability to, to, to manage things. Uh, and so as we talk, uh, as we talk through these, um, I, I want to, as often in, in, in any workspace, uh, this starts around how do we think about safety guidelines as, as people are entering the workplace? And, and this is, um, this is uh, really, really important. And let me forward the slide. And uh, it, it starts by having um, just uh, in every organization needs to really think through um, a, a, the proper and appropriate end to end process of how you're going to keep your workforce and staff or customers safe in a work site or in an environment. And we talk about from, from screening to cleaning. Uh, and this is an illustrative map that, that came from um, some work at, at one of the clients we're working with. Uh, that talks about how it's really, really critical for an organization to really think through this end-to-end -end process uh, and involve uh, not just everyone in operations, but uh, human resources, uh, legal, health and safety, and other stakeholders to make sure we're, we're thinking about things end-to-end. -end. And a key part of this actually is making sure that it is safe uh, and appropriate for people to enter uh, a place of work or a facility. Uh, so the whole concept of having some type of screening process uh, and temperature check is is really really important to that 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 process, and um, and that uh, can pervade its way through the the, the rest of the uh, the entire end end process of thinking about making sure we keep people safe as they as they're in the work environment. So we'll probably come back to some of this a little bit later when we think of things like social distancing. Uh, movement analytics uh, and, and other types of things, uh, but it starts with uh, with, with this process. And uh, when we think of uh, when we think of entering the workplace, uh, there's a, a couple of things that we've seen has been uh, have been uh, quite effective and, and quite important for organizations to think about. And uh, the whole point of uh, of, of screening and, and also contact tracing. Uh, is front and center. Uh, so when uh, when again a, a work site is open and we're we're um, we're making decisions around uh, who can come and whether people are healthy and safe to to come to work, um, technology can help uh, help make that happen in a in a very uh, effective way. And that can involve a, a pre-screening questionnaire to collect data, uh, and it's something that you can actually report on uh, and and then use to to manage uh, and uh, and um, and uh, do everything from Again, making decisions on whether uh, people are, are safe to come into the workplace, but but also uh, to understand who's been in the workplace and in what part, uh, in order to understand that God forbid there's a, there is an issue or a COVID positive test result, you've got a record of uh, who's been in the facility uh, when they've been there, uh, and you have uh, some uh, some some way to to sort of use that to help uh, help with the contact tracing uh, process. Now, contact tracing can take a number of forms, uh, both what we call passive contact tracing, which I've, I've just described, which largely revolves around, around um, uh, people filling information out, uh, uh, temperature checks, and, and keeping records of, uh, of when people have been in and out. Uh, there are also uh, several what we'll call very ac uh, more active contact tracing solutions uh, that we're helping clients with. Uh, that can uh, track their movement in a facility uh, where they've been, whether they've been in touch with people uh, or closer uh, closer than a, a six foot radius or any type of social distancing guideline. And we find that that's, uh, th those types of things are all really relevant and important uh, for organizations to think through. Uh, but, uh, but there are uh, some simple uh, uh, kind of mobile and, and, and enterprise solutions that, that we're putting in place with our clients uh, to help them manage the screening process uh, and, and manage, uh, manage their, uh, their, their employees in and out of the workplace. 
So we find this to be a really, really important thing to do. Uh, you know, if, if you don't have something like this, then uh, the risk might be uh, some type of paper process, and that's very hard to manage, particularly when you've got a large facility. Uh, and the tools that we've put in place with clients, we've, we've done this uh, with organizations everywhere from 50 to 100,000. Uh, so uh, there, there's, there's a wide variety, and this isn't really a question of technology scaling, but really tailoring it around how you want to work and, and what's important in your, in your process. Part of the process as well, when we think of digital enablement, is temperature scanning as well. Now, temperature scanning is not at all uh, an end-all and be-all around COVID screening, but it is an important part of the hygiene that every organization uh, needs to put in place. Uh, no doubt, um, your organizations are probably already doing this, uh, and we're helping our clients uh, put in the right technology for this. Uh, these can range from $99 um, kind of handheld scanners uh, all the way to um, very, very expensive uh, thermal cameras uh, that even have uh, things like image recognition involved in it. And uh, for organizations to think about what to put in place and, and how to manage it, that's a, a trade-off around, uh, around uh, how you want to, uh, how you want to uh, uh, run it and in, 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 in kind of where, where your investment profile is. But again, this is a very important uh, part of the, the, the process that uh, everybody should be thinking about. So Dairon, uh, let's talk next about the facility planning and, uh, and some of the, uh, the next steps there. Yeah, I think uh, one kind of key sort of thread that you'll hear through all of this too is that there is a communication piece um, that's going to have to take place at each phase of this wheel. And I know folks are getting a lot of different messages and the messages are changing quickly and understanding and having sort of the authoritative uh, perspective to, to confidently go in and say, okay, here's what we're going to do and have some real bright lines established. I think you saw in, in some of those previous slides, even about thermal screening, that's you know, not when, when folks get into this, they find it's not as simple as they thought it would be uh, with all the different technologies. And we had folks coming onto sites that uh, maybe had run the last hundred yards to the facility to make sure they weren't late and, you know, scanned a little bit hotter than, than maybe they normally would and making provision for those folks to sit down and cool off and, you know, normal room temperature so you can get an accurate reading. Um, you know, making sure that people understand that there's a process to this and some of those bright lines may have to be, you know, navigated through intelligently. So keeping the thinking in this um, and, and building as much of that into your plans as you can, because the last thing you want to do is have some a, n a number of false alarms and you don't want to have, you know, a situation where you're over cleaning or under cleaning and, and finding that sweet spot is, is really is a really difficult thing to do. Um, so putting the proper protocols in place, looking at, I think we'll talk a little bit in this about, you know, some site modeling that can be done on the front end to try to get to this point where workplaces are safe, where people are appropriately physically distant from one another, um, where, where they can confidently, you know, be at work and, and know that their surfaces are clean and that they're not at risk at, or at unnecessary risk. And I think you know, kind of what we've built digitally around that is, you know, looking at ways to manage that physical distancing. So I think, Bob, you want to show some sure. of the tools that... Yeah, and I've got one slide here that talks about how technology can be used to help um, enforce and manage and track uh, social distance compliance. So when we think of the typical guidelines uh, that have been put in place by our public health authorities, when we talk about a six foot working distance, um, you, you know, when, when we think of, um, when we, we think of keeping a safe workplace, uh, it's very important that every organization obviously have policies uh, to, uh, to sort of support and promote safe distancing, um, in addition to things like wearing masks and, and so forth. Uh, but technology can help, uh, help support this. Uh, and this is an example of um, where relatively low cost uh, Bluetooth technology um, uh, can be used uh, to um, track and, and, uh, and help enforce uh, compliance. Uh, some of the technology have active alerts where when uh, people um, get inside a, a predefined uh, distance uh, that can be set in the system, uh, that can uh, generate a haptic alert in a Bluetooth card. 
uh, and I'll be tracked uh, in the workplace environment using uh, be uh, Bluetooth beacons and gateways. Uh, this is something we're doing with several clients uh, that want to have, uh, again, a technology-enabled way of, of helping to uh, enforce social distance uh, management. Um, and I would make a comment that when, as we start thinking about things like this, uh, the topic around legal privacy risk, uh, storage of personal data um, comes into play. And those are absolutely important considerations that have to be vetted. Uh, and addressed by uh, by your um, uh, your relevant authorities and, and teams. Uh, but what we've certainly found, uh, both internal uh, as we've applied some of these things inside GHD, as well as with our clients, is that um, is that, uh, that those are are all absolutely kind of doable conversations, uh, because um, with the the COVID environment, um, the, uh, the the we, we, there's a a lot of a lot of, uh, a lot of um, I'll call it support and, uh, and, and leeway for, for organizations to do the right thing to maintain health and safety. Happy to answer specific questions on those matters later uh, as needed. So Dyron, we're yeah, moving so on to the next phase. This is one that's near and dear uh, to my heart. Um, you know, once you kind of get to the implementation phase, this is really kind of getting back to business, right? So, um, once back in business, you know, there are still some compliance elements that have to be looked after. Uh, and one of the things that we've seen, for example, at OSHA is not letting up on is the use of respirators and the implementation of an appropriate respiratory protection program. And we've had uh, work with a large retailer um, that basically has made a, a, an elective effort to fit test some of their staff for the purpose of those staff being able to remain in close contact with some of their customers. And it's been a, a pretty large undertaking uh, that we've done for this client and then for for others to basically to track their respira respiratory uh, protection programs. And, you know, the, it, it takes me back again to what what is becoming more a part of the popular vernacular. And, and when people become with the familiar with the term industrial hygiene. It's very exciting to me. Uh, I obviously feel very close to that and understanding the different options that people have and in, in what we call the hierarchy of controls. If you don't know the hierarchy of controls, I would encourage you to go check that out. It is uh, something that my wife even found interesting. I had her uh, listening to a podcast on industrial hygiene uh, during this, which just goes to show you that we're all Kind of shifting our attention to things that we might not have found interesting uh, you know a few months ago so the hierarchy of controls basically is an inverse pyramid that starts with the elimination of a hazard and ends up at the the very sort of most primitive way to control the hazard is by the use of personal protective equipment um, you know we mentioned getting places back to work and people automatically go to personal protective equipment and use of respirators to keep facilities in operation. Well, in reality, if there are other means of eliminating or substituting for or putting in engineering controls or administrative controls to prevent that hazard, in doing so, you prevent having to have workers in respiratory protection, which presents its own potential hazards. And that's one of the reasons that OSHA has not let up on this requirement. So from a compliance standpoint, OSHA is requiring facilities if they're going to have people in respirators to have a formal resp respirator respiratory protection program to track w how those folks have been medically cleared to wear respirators or to wear a respirator if you haven't done it is restrictive to your breathing uh, and people need to be medically cleared by a doctor in order to be able to do that um, there's just hazards just in terms of uh, we've had places that we're that we're working with that you know, folks are working in hot environments or they're working in environments that they're doing a number of physically uh, demanding tasks. For those types of environments, it may not be the best option. And so being able to track all the compliant uh, activities that are behind the scenes for a facility that's got a respirator protection program, m making sure that if OSHA comes on site and says, and what the guidance is that they're giving their compliance officers is, to make sure that facilities are still complying with the requirements of this uh, particular regulation. So 
we, we've built a way for us to make sure that that documentation is in place and is all in one place uh, just by you know, the acknowledgement of the uh, employee themselves that they have been appropriately fit tested and that they understand the training. And the training can't be understated here either, can't be overstated, the importance of it is that the, the employee understands what that respirator can and can't do, how it, can, how it ought to be cared for. And we've seen some, you know, some uh, modifications to OSHA's and the FDA's requirements for respirators through this whole process. So that's some, again, looking at some of those guidelines and how they're changing in near real time. Uh, the use of KN95 respirators, for example, has been approved in certain conditions. And the reuse of those respirators has been approved where those were historically more of a one-time use, but, but due to the supply chain, you know, that's been allowed for. But again, with the proper care usage and storage of those and making sure that the employees understand, you know, what those limitations are is a, is a key element to this. And to make sure that they've got, you know, some ownership in the, in the program themselves and that they understand that it is a, a formal program and that it is, it, to comply with that that OSHA uh, rule. So that's been one I think that we've seen a lot of success with. Bob, if you want to go to the next Perfect. one. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm thinking, I, I know we're, um, I, I'm a little conscious of time, so I want us to uh, uh, move this ahead um, a, a, a little bit quickly so we've got time for questions. Um, um, I, uh, I, I think we've made, uh, I think on the review, and maybe I could make a comment here and then go right to the to the people yeah. movement modeling, if that's okay. Um, and uh, as, as, um, as, as Diane had mentioned, uh, everything around uh, compliance uh, monitoring and reporting is a critical part of, of really running uh, and, uh, and succeeding in this environment. But the most important thing is for the organization to be taking stock of what's working and what's not working and make improvements uh, on that. And uh, there are uh, a, a number of ways that organizations can think about using data and applying analytics uh, to help do that as, as they're thinking about improving health and safety and operations in the workplace. We wanna give one example here uh, of a digital enabler, uh, and this is around people movement modeling, and it relates a little bit to the social distance tracking that we talked about before. Uh, but this is something where, um, where an organization, uh, particularly one that involves uh, and works with uh, large uh, volumes of, of people, so it could be a large factory, a large work site where you have large and busy traffic areas. It could be uh, an environment where you have consumers or, um, or, um, or, or other people. And this is maybe a, a visualization of, uh, of a, a public facility in, say, a a restaurant or a shopping mall, uh, but um, there are um, uh, really uh, some terrific capabilities um, and, uh, and techniques in place uh, that can uh, build uh, analytic models out of people movement uh, within a site or within a facility uh, and uh, uh, within the context of a 3D model of the facility uh, to use that to make decisions, uh, to run scenarios, uh, to plan options, uh, and if you think of um, a, a large facility and you think about the, the need to uh, stagger uh, work shifts uh, or lunch shifts or uh, change uh, um, entry and exit points, uh, if you're going to be moving to one-way uh, hallways and thinking about what that means uh, for the flow of people and whether that's going to impact social distancing compliance, um, there's the ability to run people models on this. And uh, at, uh, at GHD, we have a, a division called uh, Movement Strategies uh, who actually specialize in this. Uh, and we're doing a, a bunch of work with, with clients in a, a number of different industries. Uh, they've done work um, in our, our, our team of, of Movement Strategies. People have done work in lots of industries, including the London Olympics, for example, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as proof points for these kinds of things. And we find this is really, really important and relevant for organizations to think about. Uh, this may not uh, make sense for every facility and every organization, but it is a, a pretty valuable uh, capability. So the final part is around communications. This is really the, the last slide in the wheel that we were gonna go through. And uh, Dyron, uh, it'd be great for you to maybe give, uh, give a couple of points here. Yeah, I think this is 
back to that common thread, right? And I think in each one of those other elements of the wheel, your 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 communication piece uh, is extremely extremely important. I know that comes up as every sort of after action review that we go through. Um, we look back on this and we say, you know, what could we have done better? And every after action review I've ever been on on any large scale or small scale emergency has always been, well, we should have communicated better. And I would say, you know, now is the time when we're sort of in the middle of this to reflect on what could we be doing, whether it's having another touch base, you know, with your team on a biweekly or a semi-weekly basis, you know, increasing those touch points. We've got these tools, the video conferencing and things that are keeping us together and keeping people informed and keeping people updated as things change, not being afraid to make those touch points more frequent. Uh, make them available, make them, you know, recordings, that, different things that people people can access, you know, after the fact and on their own time. I think we've got the technology in place to be able to do that pretty, pretty easily, uh, and we need to take advantage of it. So having the, you know, one of the things I think that, of course, we've seen that getting called into from the expertise perspective is, making sure you've got kind of that trusted group that is going to be available to have those conversations, make sure they are available, make sure that, you know, they're, they're, they, they understand the importance of that communication piece to keep things going and, and creating those communications channels too, if something does go wrong. Uh, I think that's another important one is making sure that people know if they have a question, if something goes wrong, they know ex exactly who to ask and when and how that communication chain is going to run from there. In the emergency response world, we call it an incident command structure or an incident management system. And that's really where we are here. And if you have that organized flow of information, you're able to respond more quickly. You're able to get to that kind of point of recovery and resolution um, a little more quickly and effectively. So I guess that's that's my comment right. on. Thank you very much. So yeah. what does this all mean? Um, we've ta taken you through a whole tour of, uh, of things and, um, and we hope that, that that wheel and some of the examples were, were helpful at maybe jogging your thinking, potentially giving you some new ideas. I think the, the larger point uh, that we certainly know and I think you're probably all living and seeing is that there is going to be a new reality. Uh, and the reality is that technology and digital transformation is accelerating. Uh, the COVID crisis uh, is forcing uh, every organization to think differently about uh, how it can um, uh, manage uh, through uh, crisis. Uh, and when you have a, a big uh, challenge like we are facing now, um, we wanna build in uh, resiliency, uh, automation, faster decision making, and so forth to run and manage our businesses uh, better and, and differently. And um, if anything, um, you know this uh, this uh, situation is going to accelerate the focus organizations need to be thinking about their use of of technology in, in the workplace. Um, uh, and uh, one of the, the ways to think about that is, is around, um, you know, what we call Industry 4.0. And uh, Shashank uh, Ramanan on our team is here. This is really the last slide we had. And we just wanted to put this up for a second as just an example of some of the kinds of things that organizations need to think about. I, I don't think we probably have a lot of time to go into this in a lot of detail, um, given the timing. But, but Shashank would love it if you could... Uh, provide a um, maybe a, a, a note on some of the things you're seeing uh, here as it relates to uh, Industry 4.0. Yeah. Uh, hi, Bob. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. That's great. So uh, thanks, Bob. Thanks for the great presentation. And, um, um, you know, I just wanted to cover this slide in brief. I know that we don't have too much of time. Um, so as we think about automation, right, and as we come back from uh, the situation that was the COVID-19 situation that we have as we come back and start our people working again. Um, we need to concentrate on also what, you know, how digital will help the overall landscape. And that's why I put up the slide uh, only from a perspective that, um, uh, you know, as we begin to, to kind of uh, delve into that journey of digital, uh, it's important to know what all the technologies are there for us. 
So uh, the slide that I put up here is more of the ISI, uh, the Industrial Society of Automation, ISA, 95 levels of automation. Uh, you have different levels here. So we start with a level zero, which is devices and equipment. We start with a level one, that's sensors, automation. We start with a level two, that's control, SCADA, HMI. I think most of us are there on the level two right now. Um, and then we have a level three and a level four, and then finally the IoT and the cloud platform. So where we come in is that there are three terms, right, that we continuously misuse in the industry. And um, as a digital practitioner, I just wanted to clarify these three terms, uh, you know, across the board. So one is uh, digitization. Um, so when we talk about digitization, right, uh, it's mainly uh, the level one and the level two processes that we are trying to achieve. So we will have some kind of automation in place. We will have some kind of SCADA system, HMI system, or even sensors and automation. So that's the level one that we talk about, which is digitization. The second level that you know we would want to migrate towards is digitalization. So when we talk about digitalization, uh, that's more towards incorporating systems around, um, you know, either we have an EAM, enterprise manufacturing system, or we have further MESs um, or LIMS or other data that we are trying to incorporate. So that's the second level that you know we talk about from a digitalization perspective. And finally, uh, we talk about digital transformation. So uh, for example, right, um, we, we have the entire um, chemicals, for example, right? We are, we are getting in um, a whole bunch of chemicals into our plant for water treatment, or we are getting in a whole bunch of chemicals. So how do we, track that from a supply chain perspective. Um, do we have the right metrics to track that? Do we have the right ROI benefits that we are getting? Are we doing the ordering just in time or are we doing the ordering proactively? Um, so all of our systems can then integrate with the, with the SAP system or with the, um, you know, with, with the systems that we have currently in the plant to be able to generate more IoT and cloud-based setup. And when we talk about IoT and cloud-based setup, it's more towards, um, you know, how do I give you the information um, on the mobile, on the laptop, on devices that you can access. So um, this is just a chart out slide in terms of, you know, how we can build our roadmap from manufacturing perspective. Um, you know, it's, it's a self-evaluation where we are on this curve right now. We can be at level one, we can be at level two. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to leave the point there that you know we can help you get to the further levels on this solution as well. Yep, thanks Bob. Great, Over thank you. you Shashank. And yeah, I mean, that is, is one example of, uh, of the future uh, and certainly it's something you're all living. So thank you very much for the time. We really appreciate it. Uh, and um, I think we might've gone a couple minutes long, but we, uh, we hope this was helpful. So Russell, back to you, oh, or I mean, Scott, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah no, um, Bob, thank you and uh, yeah. thank your team. And uh, uh, it was a great presentation, tremendous amount of data. Um, I'm sure there's a, a, a lot of questions we'd like to ask. Uh, I guess in the, uh, we're kind of running out of time here. Uh, I believe this presentation will be sent out to all the participants here with and it does have your contact information I would hope and um, I think we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll try to go through the uh, the local um, Q and A's from from Chad and, and Christina uh, on theirs and then if we have time we'll we'll follow up with a few questions right at the end of it, if that's okay thank you okay um, Chad are you um, are you available I know you I, had a hard stop. Yeah, and actually, I was gonna say, in the uh, respect to everybody's time and and the information, so there can be a chance for questions. Um, if you'd like, I can just go ahead and add some talking points to my presentation and resubmit to share to the team, and just uh, skip mine and go straight to Christina because uh, it's definitely good information sharing, um, and I don't want to cut anybody short because I've got a hard stop. So, okay, just okay, that would be good, Chad, because we've got. Um, 
I know you've got a good perspective on this being in the uh, nutraceutical uh, area, um, uh, whatever, you know, a lot of people don't fully understand what that is. So, but uh, I'm sure it sounds pretty uh, scientific and, uh, and pretty complex. So uh, well, that'll I be can great. barely spell it, so, but it, it's yeah. good though. <laughs> yeah, I can barely pronounce it, but no, thank you and uh, apologize we ran over and you didn't get to, to do yours. So uh, thank you though for being available. And, so with that, Christina, um, Christina Lawson with Daisy Brand would like to discuss what uh, Daisy Brand's done on a local level to ensure business uh, uh, continuation during the pandemic. So Christina, are you available? There we go, there's Christina. Hey. Sorry about okay. that. I was on mute and I was trying to figure out how to navigate that. Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, Daisy has done a lot of the components that were mentioned in the last presentation. Um, all of those primarily um, through trial and error. So it's nice to have a much more structured formula to kind of walk yourself through. So hopefully people find that um, very helpful in a little bit more organized manner rather than trial by fire. Um, but the one thing that we've done from the very beginning, um, and Daisy is is been committed to this for as long as I've worked there in the past 12 years, um, is really just the number one priority being the health and safety of our employees. Um, you know, uh, just really making sure that our employees feel like they are safe um, and secure every day that they come to work um, has been probably the, the biggest um, benefit that we've received. And we've done that through, I would say, probably three different avenues, uh, one being communication, another being environment, and then the third one being education. So, you know, around communication is just creating a very open forum to have conversations with employees when they think that they're not feeling well or that they've been exposed um, from a risk perspective. So a few things that have enabled us to have that open communication is, is not giving employees really any reason to not be truthful in their pre-screen um, questionnaires or when they call in because they are sick. So we've adjusted our PTO policy um, to where that doesn't hit people's PTO. Um, you know, the company takes that on. And so rather than a lot of times, I think what happens is people don't feel quite well. They work until they kind of resolve the situation. And then if they don't feel well, go home or, you know, take time off. Um, we've really reversed that from a, a proactive perspective and have them First, if you don't feel well, stay home, then let's talk about it, assess the risk and figure out when is a good time for you to come to work, uh, whether it's your own um, illness or anybody that you uh, live with as well. Um, you know, same thing, uh, as you can see on the screen here, you know, we've um, waived the telemedicine copay as well so that employees have quick access to that. We just don't want that to be something that um, prevents people from seeking out help and trying to figure out if they really are um, at risk. Um, and so, so those are a lot of the things where if people have had questions or, or concerns, we've talked about that through people. The other thing is, is when people are homesick, um, as the plant manager, I've personally called each one of those individuals to make sure that they do feel like they're getting adequate care to really understand their situation and make sure that they feel, um, you know, whatever support or um, um, help that they might need. Um, around environment, you know, this is a laundry list of things, but um, everything from, you know, face covering, social distancing, um, you know, even down to we've got community tools like uh, forks and spoons and knives. We went to those as individually wrapped anytime we serve food individually done for people when we do, you know, food celebrations. We didn't want to stop those, but definitely didn't feel like a family, but Bay style catering really served its purpose in this environment. Um, having a very strict visitor protocol um, and back to the communication part, sharing what all those things are on a regular um, push out uh, communication to the plant so that they know what those are. Um, the other thing that 
has helped as well as, you know, increasing sanitation is one thing, you know, in high traffic areas and wipe down and using the janitorial staff to help with that, but also making those supplies readily available so that employees can grab for them themselves in our break rooms, our lunch room, that kind of thing. If people want to have access to them, they can grab them and clean up before and after. So again, creating that environment of feeling very safe. Um, and then just the last thing that, um, you know, has become more and more of a realization, especially as we've begun to open up the economy and travel restrictions have been lifted and those types of things, which, you know, makes me very nervous that we can't control people's personal lives and what they do and where they go. Um, but the one thing that I've found a little comfort in is providing as much education and guidance to our employees that hopefully they'll take that when they go out into, you know, navigate uh, personal interactions with people. So one thing, um, and I can uh, send it out as well, but I put together a front and back page from all the CDC guidance on travel recommendations and information links so that when employees find themselves in a place of wanting or needing to travel, that at least they're doing that with the most information, the most education, realizing that we can't you know, not have them travel, but just just making sure that they are aware of all the things they can do to keep themselves safe. Um, same thing with face coverings, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of controversy, the media tells different things, you know, just explaining why we wear them and what benefit they are. We've provided a variety of different types so that people can kind of match what their comfort level is. We never know what people's situations are at home if they have, um, you know, a, a mother-in-law or an immunocompromised person um, living with them or even themselves. And so to just try to make that um, as available as we can to fit the broadest group possible is is kind of how we've navigated that so um you know here's there's the whole list is here for you guys to look at like i said i'll send that cdc guidance all the links work it's just a copy and paste but it's a compilation of of all their things so that people can stay up to date um so that's all i have from daisy's perspective of best practices Thank you, Christina. That was that was very good, and that was uh, I think those are all great best practices to share and uh, things that uh, at a minimum we all should be doing. Um, with I want to thank you guys, um, all of you, um, the sponsors, Veritex and GHD, for uh, um, coming on today and uh, spending the time with us and uh, sharing all the details and the presentations and. Uh, We'll get that information out to the members and uh, um, and you know we really do uh, uh, think what you provided is very valuable and uh, and, uh, and great for our for our group and uh, um, and we'll also be announcing uh, future meetings um, in the coming uh, in the near future we don't know whether they'll be in person or they'll still be virtual but um, we will uh, get something out in uh, We'll do the topics based on, we're gonna send a, a survey out to try to get some feedback on how well this went and what some other topics uh, you would like us to, to focus on in future symposiums. So um, with that, if there's no questions, uh, I'll adjourn the meeting and uh, wanna say have a, have a good day and uh, have a good weekend and be safe.